I've done videos at these protests before, but basically the idea that the feminists have been spreading is that not only is being a slut something that you shouldn't be ashamed of, it's something that you should be proud of. And if you disagree, you're slut shaming. And now since society is so polluted with degeneracy and hedonism, in order to explain what used to be common knowledge, we're actually going to have to break down the science behind why slut shaming is a good thing for society. Stay tuned. John Doyle in. Heck off, commie. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off Kami. I'm just really, I'm feeling good about this one. I really want this one to blow up because it's been a while since I've had a bunch of feminists screaming at me and I really miss it. Uh, so if you want to help me achieve my dreams, give this video a thumbs up right now and leave a comment with your thoughts and maybe I'll end up defending these ideas on The View someday. Who knows? A boy, a boy can dream. So with what we talked about the other day, mass shootings being caused in part by second wave feminism, and some people ask, well, John, are you really claiming that feminism is to blame for mass shootings? No, 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 no. I'm stating the fact that the lack of father figures is breeding angry and displaced young men that are more likely to become mass shooters. Well, but didn't you also say that feminism is responsible for the lack of father figures? Glad that you were able to arrive at the same conclusion that I was. But anyways, I said I was going to talk about slut shaming, and I figured I'd just do that now while we're on the streak of highlighting how feminism has assisted in the destruction of society. So second wave feminism is rooted in Marxist and Freudian theory. Marxist theory because they essentially took the Marxist idea of class warfare and integrated that into relationships between the sexes. They reiterated the idea of false consciousness, which was a term that they got from the Marxists. And that was really convenient because they would say, hey, you're oppressed. And then the woman would say, well, no, I'm not. I'm not oppressed. And then she'd walk away. And then the camera would show a shot of the first woman like over her shoulder as she's walking away. And then the second woman, would, well, isn't that what they'd want you to think if they were oppressing you? And then she, oh, and it just, it's like an AMC type shot. And that's the thing. It's affirmative either way. Either you agree that you are being oppressed or you disagree. But then the only reason that you disagree is because you don't know that you're being oppressed. So they told women that they'd been kept from seeing their own oppression as a political condition, which creates a false illusion that a woman's relationship with her man is a matter of interplay between two unique personalities, and it can be worked out individually, but in reality, they're class conflicts that must be solved collectively, not husband versus wife, men versus women. So it perpetuated into full-scale identity politics, what we see now with genders, races, ethnicities, religion, sexualities, but in 1970, Jermaine Greer released a book, it was very influential, it's titled The Female Eunuch, and she wrote that women have somehow been separated from their libido, from their faculty of desire, from their sexuality. They've become suspicious about it. And she goes on to compare it to how farm animals only breed to appease their masters, and that's somehow the same as female sexuality. Uh, she believed that women will never be free until their libidos are recognized as separate entities. She described herself as an anarcho-communist. There's the Marx, even though Marx wasn't a full-scale anarchist, the principles of his ideology are still present with her. She also accepted the Freudian belief that all all societal problems were rooted in the repression of sexual desire. She argued that the entire system of marriage was a conspiracy to keep women down, ignoring the fact that men are competing to keep other men down in order to become as successful as possible as a means to attract the highest value woman that he can. That being said, she also notes that she hadn't yet been fully emancipated because she still fantasized about physically large and powerful men forcing kisses on her. But then she blamed that on the influence of romance literature, as if romance literature exists to regulate female desires instead of female desires that are five million years old regulating which romance literature does and does not sell and so she wrote that women were going to have to be brave enough to leave their husbands and children in the name of female empowerment oh hey uh susan your kids are worse off in literally every conceivable way jen you don't understand i am empowered now i'm depressed but trust me i love how empowered i am i have so much gray hair now i used to like have freedom to do things I wanted to. Her prescriptions for women's happiness were sexual experimentation, aggressiveness, and radical independence. These types saw sexual repression as a hang-up that was designed by men to oppress women, while at the same time, uh, their male counterparts saw them as inconvenient societal barriers to commitment-free sex. This is the biggest joke probably in the history of male-female relationships. Feminists actually managed to convince generations of women that engaging in casual sex was empowering for women. Here's why. Men have a substantially higher sex drive than women. Head, like, <laughs> headline as if we had to go over that, but we're going to talk about the evolutionary psychology behind it. And feminists hate evolutionary psychology because it effectively acts as the antithesis of feminism because it just cuts through all the but social constructs with, hmm, 
interesting concept, but we have hundreds of studies on human nature that successfully replicate on dozens of cultures throughout the world, so I'm not so sure about that one. But hey, I like the enthusiasm. We welcome the enthusiasm that is there, uh, the Green New Deal. Anyways, the part of the male brain that regulates sexual urges is about two and a half times the size of the corresponding section of the female brain. If men and women really had the same level of sexual desire, prostitution wouldn't exist and Playgirl would have more than 3,000 subscriptions and half of them wouldn't be gay men. Men are also more able to walk away uh, from a, a casual sexual encounter than women are. And why is this? Because sex is not just physical. The sexual revolution set out to separate sex from intimacy and from responsibility, but women still secrete more oxytocin during sex than men do. Oxytocin has been nicknamed the bonding hormone. Why would women secrete more of this during sex than men? Because if she becomes pregnant with that man's child, she's going to have a very hard time getting another man to help her raise that child since it doesn't belong to him. So she bonds to the man that impregnated her in the first place. We've had contraception for a few generations, yeah, but these systems are 5 million years old. They're not going anywhere. They're built into us. And men also have an incentive, by the way, to stay committed to one woman because it's the best way that they can ensure their paternity. But on the other hand, they also have an incentive to impregnate as many women as possible so that they can perpetuate their gene pool to the fullest extent. Uh, and women don't like this very much because if a man has multiple children with multiple women, less of his resources are going to be allocated exclusively to her and their child since he's inherited all these other responsibilities. So marriage or long-term committed marriage provided a solution to ancestral men who couldn't be sure of the ovulation cycles of ancestral women. Men who married would benefit reproductively relative to other men by substantially increasing their probability of paternity through repeated sexual intercourse with one woman during her ovulation cycle. And marriage provides the opportunity to ensure fidelity both through the agreement of the partners but also through the family members and through the society and the sexual revolution it's had no effects on the fact that men still regard sexual loyalty as the most desired trait and sexual unfaithfulness as the least valuable trait and men that were not as concerned by the way with the faithfulness of their partners were less likely to ensure their paternity and pass on their genes to future generations and the greatest predictor of someone's likelihood of being sexually unfaithful is the number of previous sexual partners that they've had prior to the relationship this is why chastity is a desired characteristic, and this is why women have an incentive to preserve their virginity um, until marriage. And it's not, well, women are expected to be good girls. It's because, it's because when women employ coyness into their mating strategy, it does a few things. Firstly, it acts as a litmus test for men. Men, regardless of their mating strategy, be it a short-term strategy or long-term strategy, they want sex. And so by withholding access to sex, women can assess the level of commitment that the man has to her. If he only wanted her for a casual encounter, he'll just be inclined to leave because he's potentially missing opportunities with women that might give it up easier. And also, since chastity is a desired characteristic by men, if a woman preserves her virginity, she'll allow herself to have a competitive advantage over women that did not preserve their virginities in securing the mate with the highest value. So why is chastity important to men? Because when a man desires sex and he gets it without much struggle, he then realizes, okay, well, if it wasn't that hard for me, then it probably won't be that hard for someone else. And progressives dismiss this as the fragile male ego, when in reality, ancestral men who weren't as concerned about chastity and fidelity, they're often cuckolded, resulting in the dying off of their genetics. And this is why slut shaming exists. Here's something. Women hate sluts more than men do. Women hate sluts because women have a monopoly on the value of sex. And when other women are willing to engage in it for a lower cost, it makes it a lot harder for women to leverage commitments in exchange for prolonged sexual access. That's why when men and women uh, engage in rival degradation tactics, women will often tell a man that she is interested in that another woman is loose. And this is often very effective because men that are employing a long-term mating strategy don't want to be involved with a loose woman. That being said, if the woman in this case fails to evaluate the man's mating strategy as short-term and mistakes it as a long-term, uh, she will actually make the rival woman more attractive in this man's eyes because she's described her as more sexually available. Studies have been done on how men and women rate the attractiveness of each other based on the clothing that they wear, and men describe women that are wearing more revealing clothing as more attractive than women that are wearing less revealing clothing. And women, um, women describe men that are wearing revealing clothing as less attractive. So why is that? It's because it signals a short-term mating strategy. It signals that this guy is likely just interested in sex. Talk about slut shaming. Uh, because women associate more revealing clothing with promiscuity and short-term mating strategies. So, yes, feminists, we can reasonably conclude that when women dress provocatively, they're doing so for male attention. Men that were seeking a, um, a long-term mating strategy, they viewed the women wearing less revealing clothing as more attractive. So, women are more likely to enjoy sex when it's within the context of a committed relationship. With men, it doesn't really make a difference. This is related to why women are likely to have regrets of sexual permission, meaning they look back wishing that they had had less sexual partners, and men are more likely to have regrets of sexual uh, sexual omission meaning that they wish that they had that they wish that they they wish that they had had more sexual partners um 
And feminists say that, oh, women have to act unintelligent because men need to feel smart. And that's not accurate either. Women often employ the ditzy, naive stereotype in order to appear vulnerable during short-term mating strategies. Um, And this is done because the more vulnerable they are, the more men that they'll have approaching them, which means there's a greater selection and there's a greater chance that they'll secure a high-value mate. So what's the logical conclusion of a cultural narrative that insists that male-female relationships oppress women, that not engaging in casual sex is oppressive to women? I mean, probably a general lowering of moral standards throughout the society, a rise in infidelity and divorce and a lessening respect of women by men and vice versa. Have we observed this trend? You tell me. The progressives have broken us up by gender, race, sexuality, religion. They've sold us on the idea that we're all competing for power and the ability to oppress one another. The problem is, since everyone's culture has a different understanding of what right and wrong are, it wouldn't be fair to judge someone relative to your standard of morality if they come from a different background. So then what do you do? Since virtue is no longer regarded by what is right and what is wrong, since neither of those things exist anymore because morality is relative, the only way then that you can be virtuous is to be tolerant of everyone else's beliefs and behaviors. This is why one of the worst things that someone can be in 2019 is judgmental. You're so judgmental. Stop judging me. There's an important distinction to be made with regards to judging. We should not, we shouldn't judge people. I should not look at you and say, You are not good. That's not my declaration to make. It's not my job. That being said, we must judge actions if we are to maintain a civilized society. It isn't good to cheat on your partner. Don't be judgmental. That's not the same thing as making an assertion of someone's value. Sexuality is natural. I mean, right, so is violence, so is appetite, but we still regulate those things to some degree within society so that we aren't maiming each other or eating ourselves. Well, that's not a good example because we have the fat acceptance movement going on right now. But if we don't discuss the actions that people take and make judgments about them, eventually, if not already, everything will be acceptable and society will totally collapse. Hey guys, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up down below and leave me a comment too. It'll help me compete in this algorithm that is already trying to censor me. According to some of you, they remove likes. Um, Also, make sure you have notifications turned on so that they don't separate us because I'd be bummed. I don't don't want us to get separated. I'd rather rather enjoy this dynamic that we have going on, you and I. Uh, So thank you so much for watching and may God bless America.